Good evening and welcome to Sarmaya Talks. Um, it's good to see you all. Thank you for choosing to spend your Saturday evening with us. Sarmaya is a digital museum with a diverse collection of art and historical artifacts. And we, make, we aim to make art and history accessible to everyone in immersive and engaging ways, both online and on ground. Sarmaya Talks is an extension of that belief. And um, we aim for it to be a space to have conversations and learning around art, history, and culture. It is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, who will take us on a journey, looking at botanicals from an Eastern and Western perspective. Pavitra Rajaram is founder and creative director of the award-winning interior design firm, Pavitra Rajaram Design. For 25 years, Pavitra was the lead designer of the luxury retail brand, Good Earth. Since 2017, as brand custodian at Sarmaya, Pavitra has driven an experience-led brand strategy, one that focuses on innovative, immersive programming to engage younger audiences in the art, history, and culture of India. Pavitra is a recipient of several awards, including the Intact Urban Heritage Award, and a five-time winner of the prestigious AD100, awarded annually to the 100 most influential designers in the subcontinent. Passionate about India's rich repository of art and culture, Pavitra is most excited about projects that connect her with craftspeople and weavers. Please join me in welcoming Pavitra. Hi, everyone. It's lovely to see so many friends here. And like Avehi said, thank you so much for choosing to spend your Saturday uh, with us. Um, for many of you who know me, uh, I'm passionate about gardens and plants, um, but I want to take a mom moment to say that I uh, would like to remember my mother-in-law, Elikuti Abraham, whom we lost in uh, January of this year. Um, she was a wonderful human being and she lived many of the things that I'm going to talk about today, and I had the pleasure and privilege of spending the last few years in her company. Um, she grew up in Kerala and uh, her father was a physician, a healer, a specialist in natural herbs and, and the plants of the region. And as a young girl, she would often go into the forest that abounded the estate and choose and pick the right medicinal plants and bring them back. Mummy was known to have a remedy for everything. There was always a kada, a kashayam, a, a leaf, a flower, something that would cure you. And um, she had an abiding love for nature. Our uh, balcony garden in our home is a testament uh, to her absolute audacity when it came to planting gardens. And we have many uh, chiku trees and papaya trees that are jostling with bougainvillea and frangipani. Um, so you never quite know what's going to come out of the pot because mummy had green fingers. She'd throw a few seeds in and voila, we'd have a stunning garden. She passed on her love for gardens to her children, to my sister-in-law, Tessie, and to Paul. And one of the absolute delights um, of the pandemic was the time that we got to spend together with Mummy and some of the great local knowledge and stories and anecdotes about plants that she passed on to me and I'm very grateful for that. So I'd like to dedicate this to my very wonderful mother-in-law and uh, Mummy, this one's for you. So the Rig Veda, which is the oldest known Vedic text, presents the idea of Van Vaibhav, which is the splendor of the forest. The concept of Van Vaibhav explains that the elements of the natural world and the beauty that lies within play an integral part in defining the experience of life itself, where the splendor of the moon, the stars, the rising sun, the winds, the sky, the vegetation, the animals, birds, rivers, trees, and mountains together form the essence of joy. The coexistence of elements in the natural world is what creates beauty, oneness, and balance. The text emphasizes that all parts of nature must be venerated and protected, 
with every nuance being cherished in its own right. When one element is lost, the entire cosmic balance is altered. And living in proximity with nature creates a deep respect for the natural world and instills a desire to celebrate one's surroundings rather than commodifying it. We humans are a part of the splendor of the forest and we are lost when we move away from it. And this is essentially the philosophy of Van Weber, and this is laid out in the Rig Veda thousands and thousands of years ago. So to really accurately interpret the stories that you find in various cultures, we must understand the ways in which they engage with the natural world. In fact, the word diaspora itself, the root is the spore, the dissemination of the seed. So the creation of a human diaspora is deeply and intrinsically linked to our relationship with the natural world. And cultural perspectives vary, vary widely, and these very significantly shape the ways in which humans choose to interact with nature. Okay, this is a mahua tree. There are two ways of seeing the same tree as represented by the juxtaposition of these two images. But first, let's look at the science. The mahua tree, botanical name Maduka longifolia, is a shady, deciduous tree found in abundance in the forests of central India. Its fruit, flowers, seeds, and leaves are foraged by tribal communities, such as the Gond, which is India's largest tribal community, and the Baiga, who gathered the various parts for food, drink, and fuel. On a visit to the Amrabad Tiger Reserve just last week with my colleague Tanish, who's here in the audience, we were astounded to discover that in the Telangana forest, 3,500 square kilometers of reserve forest, the most prolific tree is the Mahua. Let's look at the second story. To the Gond and the Baigas, the Mahua represents sustenance, wealth, and divinity. They regard themselves as both worshippers and guardians of the Mahua tree, which in turn watches benevolently over each aspect of their lives, from birth to union to death. On the left, what you see here is an 18th century botanical illustration of the Mahua, commissioned by the Scottish botanist William Roxburgh. He's often considered the father of Indian botany because he was passionate, he came to India, he was a Scotsman who came to India as a, as a surgeon, got a job in a hospital uh, near Fort St. George in Madras, but really what he was crazy about was plants. So he petitioned the East India Company to allow him to have a plot of land because uh, officers in the East India Company were not allowed to acquire land in India. But he wanted to be a local farmer, he, he was passionate about seeds, he planted all kinds of things, he commissioned on his own, with his own resources, over 9,000 plant drawings. He sent specimens back to the Gardens Botanical Society in London, and he eventually ended up in, as the uh, superintendent of the Botanical Garden in Calcutta. Um, so that's just a little bit about uh, William Roxburgh and his book, Plants of the Coast of Coromandel, in three volumes, is considered even today a Bible for botanists and plant lovers. So if you look at the Roxburgh illustration that you can see here, it's a row of neat cross-sectional diagrams that lay bare the inside of flower and seed. On the right, what you see is by the Gond artist Ram Singh Urveti, and you can see that it's a worshipful ode to the Mahua, and the role that it plays in the usefulness of, and the usefulness of the Mahua, and the role that it plays in the community itself. Now, both elements, both uh, images speak to the beauty and the usefulness, if you will, of the Mahua. But only one carries an emotional charge. One highlights the physical characteristics of the tree's many parts, and the other highlights its very special significance, a larger-than-life presence rooted in a very specific 
cultural landscape. Why is this? What prompts these two different ways of seeing and interpreting and, and showcasing the same thing? Oh, there we go. Um, so the roots of this and why we see things differently, we need to go back in history and look at the developing history of European, European trade with India and how that contributed so much to the ways in which we viewed the natural world. And this really is the difference between industrial and indigenous societies. There we go. Okay. Um, when the Portuguese set sail for the east in the 15th century, and they landed on the Malabar coast in 1498, as we all know, they were followed in quick succession by the Dutch, the French, the British, and the Danes. They were all trailing the scent of spices like black pepper and cardamom, and of course the very heady promise of opium. But the first wave of European immigrants were really explorers. They included sailors, emissaries, traders, and people from the armed forces. And they were really sent here to tame the land. The next wave included doctors, cartographers, botanists, and naturalists sent here to study and inventorize. So the idea was first to come here and gain some sort of control over the natural resources of this land. And the second was then to itemize it, break it down, commodify it, inventorize it, find ways in which they could make this work for the economic success of the economies they represented. And when we look at Roxburg, who, was, uh, who I said is often called the father of Indian botany, and when you look at his book, the plants that he wrote and talked about were plants that had economic value and that were of economic advantage to his country, Britain. So it's interesting that the plants that they chose to talk about and the plants that they chose to represent were not just plants of beauty or something to be celebrated. These were things that they were trying very specifically to inventorize and identify and to see how this could re result in commercial gain for the empire. So if you look at these, uh, just as an aside, the Lusiad, it's a very interesting book. It's part of the Sarmaya collection. It was actually written um, by Luis de Cambes, who is a Portuguese poet and an adventurer, and he modeled it on the Aeneid. But what he did was he wrote a poem in stanzas, much like the epic poems, uh, the Aeneid, and he talks about Vasco da Gama's visit to India. And he takes real incidents, storms being stopped on the coast of Africa, and he converts them into this allegorical, mystical, magical story. And the reason I find this very interesting is in the East, a lot of our mystical and allegorical stories tend to talk about good and evil, ideas of morality, society, community. This is what our epics talk about. So it's fascinating to me that here is a Western epic that actually glorifies the economic trade and the exploitation of a complete different landscape for the benefit of one's own country. So the elevation of economic activity to that of myth and legend. It's really, really interesting and it gives us such a clue as to how different societies view and value economies within a community. And that, this is an uh, illustration of Vasco da Gama. And that, of course, is the city of uh, Kochi on the Malabar coast. And again, this is from 1724. So of course, they're itemizing and looking to see what India uh, can give them. They're also mapping India. They're creating geographical and um, what's the right word? They're creating roadmaps, literary, to communities, to geographies, to areas. And what are they doing? They're opening the doors for more and more Europeans to come to India and to see how things available in this country 
can be converted for the economic gain of the empires that they represent. So it wasn't random. The coming to India wasn't based just on adventure. It was based on the desire for individuals to make a fortune by finding things here that they could trade back in Europe. So scientists like Robert White, the author of Illustrations of Indian Botany, researched Indian plants in the hope of finding new medicines and other sources of revenue. In the process, of course, he created and commissioned thousands of drawings. So in the heart of colonialism, as a branch of its economic activities, botanical art struck roots and flourished. India's roots, leaves, and flowers became India's top models and global ambassadors. The botanical art that they produced were clinical documents directly related to the desire of colonizers to tabulate the wealth of their colonies. And this is not only an India story. This is an Africa story, it's a South America story, it's an Indonesia story. To them, the natural world was simply a resource to be tamed or exploited in order to increase economic gains and the financial wealth of their communities. And so, the emphasis on accuracy and realism in plant illustrations. Let's take a look at this fabulous work by Sukhnandi Vyam, a 21st century Gond artist. We'll talk about the work in, in a second. So what is the contrast between their view and how we look at things on the subcontinent? On, in the subcontinent, the indigenous com communities here saw nature as a combination of ally and the almighty. Its power was articulated not in diagrams and scientific treatise, but through folklore, song, imagery. This image by Suknandi Vyam focuses on a couple in the center encapsulated by in foliage. The opening depicted is symbolic, of course, of the yoni or the vagina or the womb, suggesting ideas of fertility reflected in the entwined couple and in the abundance of trees. Indigenous art and mythology underline the notion that the wealth represented by nature is not just material, but spiritual too. And it's interesting that Suknandi Vyam belongs to the same community as Jangar, uh, one of the most famous uh, artists of the Gond community, and they belong to the Pardhan sect of the Gond community. And the Pardhans were traditional keepers of their pe people's cultural heritage and line lineages. So they were tasked not only with remembering family genealogies, but also with transmitting legends, sacred myths, and oral histories through their songs and their storytelling. So not only is the art sacred, but the creation of the art is a sacred task as well and imbued with magic and spiritualism. Um, this is a stunning, stunning image on the left. It's by Ram Singh Urveti again from a book called The Night Life of Trees. If you don't have it, if you buy one thing in your life, buy this book, it's spectacular. But let's return once again to the forests of central India. The principal deity of the Gonds is Baradev, an all-knowing, omnipresent entity who they believe created the universe. Everything originates with him, and all beings are absorbed into him after death. Baradev is believed to live in the Saja tree, or as the botanists would have it, the Terminalia elliptica. Of course, when the Europeans came and they itemized everything, they also renamed everything. So there's no recording of traditional names of trees. And what they did is in the renaming, they also handed out favors. So if they liked a governor general, they named a particular lily, lily after him. If the tree was found in somebody's garden, it was named after a tax collector or someone that they owed a favor to. So they also traded in nomenclature as a way of owning and claiming things that were indigenous to the colonies. Um, those of you who go to the forest will be very familiar with this tree. It's what they commonly call the crocodile bark 
tree, you can't miss it. And the Saja tree, tree is really amazing for its ability to store water. So the hollow portions of the tree act as natural reservoirs and they collect the excess water. When going into the forest for days on end to collect timber and forage for fruits and berries, finding sources of water can be incredibly difficult. It's said that the Saja tree's ability to provide water and therefore enable the collection of the bounty of the forest is the reason that it's so highly regarded by the Gond community. Naturally, the Saja tree is the most sacred tree to the Gonds. It's never harmed or cut, and its branches are used only for ceremonial purposes. Basically, the tree provides them life, and in return, they pro provide the tree their protection. And if you look on the right, that is from Roxburg again, and it's an illustration of the Saja tree. On the left is, is Ram Singh Urveti's illustration of the Saja tree, where he likens it to a musical instrument, an indigenous instrument that the Gonds use. And what he's referencing again is the role of the Pardhan community in being the sacred keepers of mythology and storytelling. So in the in visual imagery of the tree, he also embeds all this myth and folklore and history and the human connection and the human guardianship that exists between the community and the forest. Through centuries, the mythologies of Bharat Dev and the Saja tree have become so closely entwined that it's impossible to tell the story of one without invoking the other. In fact, it's impossible to tell any story of the Gonds or Gond art or Gond history as a people without mentioning the Saja tree. Here's another beautiful view of Bada Dev. It's again by Ram Singh Urveti. And here you will say, see that Bada Dev reside, resides in that hollow where the water is collected. And around him in concentric circ circles is the entire matrix of nature and the forest. So you have the birds, you have the insects, you have the fish, you have the turtles, the amphibians in the outermost circle, and they're all en encapsulated right in the, in the tree trunk and surrounded by leaves. Bittu Segal, uh, uh, the founder of Sanctuary, often uh, I remember taught my children when they were young. He used to say, jungle nadi ki maa hai. You know, when you have the forest, you have water. When you have water, you have life. So let's look at these cultural uh, approaches and really the difference between a hierarchical approach and a holistic approach to humans and how our, our role and our um, place on this planet. So this is something called the Great Chain of Being. It's an illustration created uh, by the Mexican Diego Valdez, and he was actually tasked with creating a manual for Franciscan monks. So this was given to Franciscan monks in training. So when they were trained on how to go out and how to convert and how to build the community, they were also told why they had to do this. And instrumental in that why was to see the role of humans in what they called the great chain of being. So if you contrast that Gond creation myth to this Western concept of the cha chain of being, where everything in God's world is arranged according to hierarchy. Man, and I mean man, occupies the central place in the great chain, stretching between angels and animals. At the lowest level of the chain are minerals, and they are deemed non-living things to be at the furthest distance from God. Plants, of course, are only one step above them. This worldview is further illustrated and defined by a narrow interpretation of the biblical philosophy that places man at the apex of creation with complete freedom to exploit his surroundings. The tendency of the dominant Western Christian ethic was to place man in opposition with nature. The philosophers, Plato, Rousseau, Hobbes, Locke, they often set up 
man in conflict with nature. One of the greatest foundation myths, myths of the Western world, the myth of Gilgamesh, for example, has Enkidu, a human who is an embodiment of the wildness and ferocity of nature. And somehow Western myths constantly look at an antagonistic relationship between human and nature, the exact opposite of how our stories are set up and how our myths are created. So in the Western Christian tradition, it is seen as man's destiny to bring nature under human control. Let's just close up. You can see the trees right at the bottom. Above that, you see animals, including a unicorn right in the middle. I don't know if you can actually see that. And then all the way up to, have, to man and then the angels above. Let's now look at the native communities of India, which are influenced by Adivasi, Hindu, Jain, and Buddhist philosophies. For us, nature is the lens through which the entire cosmos is viewed. What Hindus refer to as the sea of consciousness, what we refer to in particle physics as the unified field, an attempt to describe all fundamental forces and the relationships between elementary particles in terms of a single theoretical framework arises from the collective experience of humankind within nature itself. Particle physics says at the end of the day we are all vibration. That's what the Hindu sea of consciousness believes as well. It's an allegorical, mythical way of describing what is a scientific, now considered one of the most, um, what's the right word, one of the most complex and um, fundamental scientific ideas. In Jain philosophy, the world is divided into three parts and we're looking at this beautiful uh, Loka Purusha, which is tempera on, on cloth. And let's just take a little bit of a deeper look at this painting. So the world is divided into three parts. The world of gods on top, Urdhva Loka. The world of men and women in the middle, Manushya Loka. And the world of the damned at the bottom, Adha Loka. Pictorially, these ideas often shown superimposed on a being called the Loka Purusha, who personifies the known and the unknown worlds. The most important of these three worlds is the Manushya Loka, which is further split into two and a half islands, Adhai Dvipa. This is how Jainism imagined the mortal world. This beautiful painting of the Loka Purusha contains the Adhai Dvipa in the center. Each concentric circle is represented by one island and it's topped by Mount Meru, which was believed to be the source of the world's primary river systems. Each island circle is filled with various types of flora and is separated from the other by thinner rings representing water bodies with creatures of the sea and amphibians, fish, turtles. The torso of the Loka Purusha depicts shrine-like structures on a rocky region that represent the Urvdva Loka, heaven. The shrines also make appearances in his ears and on his forehead, the connection between what we hear and what we think, what we experience, what we feel, and how we translate that as thought. And that is what symbolizes the realm of liberation or moksha. So let's look at this idea of written cultures versus oral cultures. Storytelling, poetry, art are all important elements of language and they help us to connect to nature and make meaning of the human condition. Societies through history have been distinguished by the modes through which they make these connections. Oral cultures communicated through spoken words and written cultures prop propagated through reading and writing. In an oral culture, storytelling or mythology plays an integral role, like in the Pichwai that you see here on the right. So the trunk of the banana tree 
is not just a banana tree, it's also the symbol of Lord Vishnu. Its stem is then used in the ritual puja of Vishnu and his incarnations because the presence, the physical presence, also showers prosperity. And the fruit is then offered as a devotional offering to thank the Lord for the beneficial properties of the tree. Now the image on the right, if you look at the image on, sorry, the right is the pitchvai, and if you look at the image on the left, okay, sorry, the one on the right, uh, what it does is, it's not only an accurate illustration of the banana leaf, but it also encapsulates in that mythical world the spiritual dimension of the tree itself. Now, Western cultures, written cultures, consider these myths primitive, the preoccupation of communities that are yet to develop. And the clear-cut distinction between written and oral cultures stems from the assumption that mythic thinking must evolve into rationality through the power of literacy. It was the American economist Edward Chamberlain who pointed out that a bias against oral cultures makes members of Western societies often overlook oral forms of communication that they themselves practice. This leads to all kinds of emotional dysfunction, alienation, uh, people feeling disconnected from their own homes, their own communities, their own environment. It also feeds Western egocentrism and reinforces a false hierarchy between written and oral cultures. On the left is a banana tree, and I must tell you anecdotally, we struggled to find an image of a banana tree. And we were not able to figure out why. We looked in, uh, you know, in the BNHS we, uh, reserves, we looked at Roxburgh, we looked at Wallach, we looked at all the botanical texts, and we could not find an illustration, a botanical illustration of the banana tree. We finally found its botanical name, Musa, and searched with that and found this uh, image in the Botanical Survey of India. But one of the things that I'm going to track down and try and figure out is why did they not represent the banana tree? There must be some reason to it, and I, if I ever find out, I definitely will let you all know. So this is one that's very fashionable now. It's Moringa, but uh, as a South Indian, I've known it all my life as Murungaka, we grew up eating it. I know that uh, it's very popular in Maharashtra uh, as well, and it has all kinds of amazing um, antioxidants and great health benefits. Um, and this is again from Robert White's book, which was called Natural Orders of Indian Plants. So in literary or written cultures, the nat natural world is a series of puzzles to be solved by dissecting, labeling, and slotting pieces into categories, very important. The botanical illustration is a consequence of this philosophy of meaning making. So like in this image of the drumstick plant, um, it's called Moringa pterygosperma, that's the botanical name. The illustration is a plant record and therefore it has to fulfill certain requirements. So the illustration had to be centered on a page it had to include some detail of the plant's evolution. It had to be anatomically precise. And then as an afterthought, it had to provide labeling and also give some aesthetic satisfaction. And because these were scientific records to be studied and not to be seen as art, it was also considered unnecessary to include the name of the artist. So while the Goans in central India, this is of course called Milan or assimilation, it's by Mayank Singh Sham, he's uh, Jangar Singh Sham's son. Uh, and what a stunning, stunning work this is because it shows the assimilation of two sacred elements, paid and Pani. And he shows through the inter intermingling and the blending of the blues, the constant ongoing assim uh, assimilation that happens for all life in the forest. So the Goans in central India, despite having a highly developed visual culture uh, with specialized ways of signifying natural phenomena, they have in no way aspired to pin down and dissect nature on a piece of paper. 
they would rather revel in the infinite possibilities of the natural environment. And when one lives in nature, one develops the codes to inter interpret its visual cues and the representations that are ingrained and passed on easily through cultural myth and oral storytelling, usually in such a fundamental way from mother to child. So this is another fabulous example of the difference in ways of depicting nature between two different uh, kinds of cultures. So the colonizers' prevailing view of how plant life could be observed and described spilled over to paintings and drawings that were created strictly for pleasure as well. So what you see on the left here is a watercolor from a book called Flowers of Bombay Presidency. It was actually the first ever botanical that we acquired at uh, Sarmaya. And it is by Mary Elizabeth Butt and her husband William Butt. They were travelers to India. And Mary Elizabeth made these beautiful illustrations. She was an artist. And she did them for her own pleasure. But you see how strongly ingrained the cultural view is that she was probably looking at a people tree. But what she did was this very, very, um, what's the right word for it? It's an extract of the whole. And even when she paints for pleasure, that's how she extracts and, and you know, paints something from nature. You can see that it's a rather plain and a clinical depiction of a dissected part of the tree. And somehow you miss, you'd never get a sense of the enormity of the people tree by looking at that. Now contrast this for a moment with uh, Bhaju Sham, also a Gond artist. And this is also a people tree from the nightlife of trees. And how beautifully he points out through his art that the perfection of the people lies in the fact that the silhouette of the tree is actually mirrored in the outline of each single leaf. So what you see here is a single leaf and also the whole tree. And the beauty of that is what he's trying to say is that the whole is the part and the part is also the whole. So to the Gons and many other communities of the subcontinent, the Pipal tree, which is called Ficus religiosa, is the abode of the divine. So how can it be anything less than perfect and anything less than holy? This is really, really stunning as well. And I'm going to, again, contrast to a, a, an indigenous style with a botanical painting. This one is from a book by Lena Lewis, which is called Familiar Indian Flowers. But Mary Elizabeth Butt painted a beautiful lotus as well. And it's here that it's part of the pop-up. And I encourage you to look at that. It's a, it's a really beautiful work. And what we realize is that it's not just the form of something. Indigenous art is also a very keen observer of function in the natural world. So in this botanical uh, illustration of the lotus, what you see is a beautiful lotus. And in, you see its deli delicately detailed seed head in the middle, which only hints at a, a sort of magic or a superpower in the lotus. But if you look at this classic Mithila art composition on the right by Dulari Devi, it's called Kobar Ghar. And this painting is usually found on the walls of the bridal chambers in Madhubani, in Bihar, where a newlywed couple spends the first few nights of their wedded life. The Kobar depicts two plants that propagate wildly in nature, the lotus occupying the central frame and the kamalban, or the bamboo staff, in the top right-hand corner, if you can see, the interlinked star-shaped image. The lotus in these paintings typically have seven buds, one in the center and six surrounding. These buds are often intricately detailed and shown with their stalks intertwined. The composition, of course, represents the union of a man and a woman. And the lotus is considered a symbol of fertility, a stand-in for the yoni or the womb, and the bamboo staff is considered a symbol of virility for the lingam or for male genitalia. 
Mithila artworks are painted largely by women and they focus very deeply on the feminine and therefore symbols of fertility, of abundance, of community take center stage. The custom of the Kobar Ghar springs from observations of the local natural world. Plant a single lotus in a pond and soon the pond is filled with blooms. This is then transformed into a blessing showered upon a newly wed couple that they may similarly go forth and multiply. In the illustration on the left, we are shown how a lotus looks, but Dulari Devi demonstrates both how it behaves in nature and how it embodies the feminine and the most uh, primal desire of the human race to propagate itself. Let's look also how nature is used as material. Pigments, paints, medicines. In the culture uh, of the subcontinent, art is also quite tangibly linked to nature in that artists use roots and flowers to actually create colors. The Matani Pachedi textiles of Gujarat that you see on the right, are they traditionally uh, are a sacred textile and they use tamarind amongst other ingredients in the dyeing process. The matano chandarvo is a sacred textile that's used actually by mar marginalized communities in Gujarat and they traditionally only use red and black colors to create figures of the multiple goddesses that they worship. The artists, mainly from the Bhagri community, they explain that their Use of two colors is the belief that black is to ward off the evil eye or to get rid of obstacles and red signifies the color of Mother Earth. The white background signifies purity. And the textile painters collect scrap iron such as nails, horseshoe, utensils and add to this collection a mixture of jaggery and water. And after a few weeks, similar to how siahi dye is made in kutch, um, where you boil uh, iron filings with molasses and in a vat for many, many weeks. Uh, and after a few weeks, what happens is they add tamarind seed flour and it turns it into a kind of a thick slime, like paste. And they mix this with a solution of iron acetate and castor oil. And that's what they get, the black ink. And they actually use like a reed pen to create the art. A mixture of al alum and tamarind flour, alum is a fixer, um, is prepared and it's used for filling in the color. And the mixture is usually yellow in color and it acts as the mordant. Once the color is, fi is filled, the cloth is then washed and dried. But the magic and beauty of this is that this color is only possible because this textile is washed in the Sabarmati. Were they to wash it in a different river, the, the, the sediment, the minerals, the natural occurring composition of that river would change completely how that textile looks. And that is why Kalamkari on the Coromandel coast, Matani Pacheri on the opposite coast looks so different because the water in which it's washed leaves its own indelible mark on the textile itself. And this is the beauty of India. This is the beauty of textiles. This is the beauty of our culture and our craft communities. And when we lose that, we will lose thousands and thousands of years of not just cultural history, but natural history. On the left is, again, a botanical illustration this is illustrations of oriental memoirs by James Forbes, also in the Sarmaya collection. And here you can see that the tamarind is represented beautifully, but you have no sense of this magic and this sense of place that comes with indigenous textiles and how they work with elements of the natural world. Uh, one thing which is of interest is this mata. So they have matas for different aspects of their life. And this Mata actually only made an appearance in the 20th century. And she's called Hadakai Mata. And she is a goddess who protects against rabies. So what is very interesting in our culture is that the response to elements in the material world 
are often codified as myth and legend. And the belief in that myth and legend and ritual is far more powerful than a sign saying, don't go here, don't touch this. That is how our culture works. Here again uh, are two, you know, so I showed you um, Gond, I've shown you Matani Pachedi. Now this is from a mural uh, on the right. This is Mithila. I think this is an image that Paul shot when we did a film in uh, Madhubani. So you'll have to talk to him about the bad um, reproduction and shadows. I'm just joking. Um, and on the left is a flame of the forest. We all know this as the palash, right? And the use of natural dyes, dyes which you see in the Madhubani, again has ritualistic and decorative purposes both. So in this mural that you see that's painted on the wall, the pink comes from Bougainvillea, the blue from Aparajita, beautiful flower, it's called the blue pea flower, and the red, yellow, and orange from the flowers of the Palash tree. Palash also has other connotation. It signifies the arrival of spring, the festival of Holi, and the often, in um, central India, Holi is celebrated by showering palash flowers on each other. The mural image depicts a similar motif of the lotus as we saw in the Kobar Ghat and the earlier Mithila works uh, that I showed you. And again, it's a symbol of fertility. And this, I think, was actually painted on uh, the walls of a, a hut in Madhubani, is that right? Paul, a young couple, a young home in Jitwarpur, in Jitwarpur. Um, okay. Um, so now I'm showing you yet another indigenous tradition. This is the Bengal Patwa, Bengal Patachitra. So in the center you see an untitled painting that's created um, in the style, in, it's a Bengal patwa made by the Chitrakar community of the region. The luminous yellow here is made from harvested wild turmeric, which is actually pictured in Mary Elizabeth uh, Butt's watercolor on the left. And the raw root is first ground till it turns into fine granules, and then it's mixed in with sticky wood apple juice, which acts as gum. The color yellow is then mixed in water and then applied to the canvas. And of course, any guesses what the bl blue is? Of course, it's indigo. And you can see on the right, that's a depiction of indigo also by um, Mary Elizabeth Butt. And the botanical name is, of course, indigo ferra. Uh, just as a, a, an interesting aside, the artist of this work, uh, Monimala Chitrakar, actually learnt her craft, as many indigenous artists do, from her grandfather, Dukushwam Chitrakar. And she is the first woman Patua artist to leave Naya, her village in West Bengal, and showcase her work professionally. This is, again, part of the Sarmaya collection. Um, so by the time Vasco da Gama came to Calicut in 1498, the Ayurvedic Yunani physicians had already amassed tons of knowledge and on all of the tropical plants. But in 1568, a naturalist physician by the name of Garcia Dorta decided to document all of this wisdom. And this is actually the first known document of Ayurvedic medicine and Yunani me medicine. And what he did was he started a series of, con he was in Goa, so he started a series of conversations with Hakims and Veds, and he put it all down in a book that was called Colloquios dos Simples e Drogas. And it was considered to be the first colonial treatise, treatise on Asian medical botany. And it had a catalog of tropical medicines and in their native habitat. This was 16th century Europe's introduction to indigenous Indian medical wisdom and it served as a practical guide for colonial settlers on coping with the illnesses of this tropic, tropical land. <coughs> Over a century later, in 1678, another scientific publication explored this rich source even further. That was the Hortus Indicus Malabaricus, a 12-volume treatise in Latin, a collaborative work 
commissioned by the Dutch governor of Malabar, Hendrik van Reed, with the approval of the, of the ruler of Calicut, and in collaboration with Itia Chudan, who was a native Ayurvedic expert. I mean, how phenomenal is, is this? So it was the first, it became the Bible of tropical botany, and it had copper plate engravings of nearly 740 plants. And this comprehensive work remains unique because the basis for creating this work was actually the palm leaf manuscripts of local physicians and healers. So Itti Achutan and three medical practitioners, Ranga Bhatt, Appu Bhatt, and Vinayak Pandit, were also cons consulted extensively and their names and contributions were also recorded in the Hortus Malabaricus. So the book records not just species that have since become extinct, but also local medical practices with details of dise diseases that a plant may cure and the relevant dosage. It's incredibly detailed and so accurate that it's referred to even now, almost six centuries later. What is also very interesting is that the entire document is labeled in four languages, Latin, Sanskrit, Malayalam, and Konkani, with the Malayalam also written in Arabic script. I cannot talk about botany without talking about the Mughals. Actually, I can't talk about anything without talking about the Mughals. Uh, so let's take a look at this beautiful, beautiful lily illustration, probably the finest botanical illustration ever made by the master Nadirul Mansur in the court of Jahangir. So even while the Dutch had started commissioning scientific publications on medicinal plants, the Mughals had already established this legacy of botanical record keeping in their ateliers. And for them, of course, this was the highest form of art. The Mughal ateliers were a place where the various traditions of indigenous, Persian, and European themes came and styles blended together to create these beautiful botanical studies. The Mughal karkanas housed calligraphers, painters, gilders, and binders who borrowed the European herbal composition rendering of a flower presenting every possible angle, part, and stage of life while painting plants native to India and beloved of the emperors. If Babur was the lover of gardens, the one who really wrote detailed graphic description of flowers, Akbar was the one who brought the Persian artist to his court. Babur fancied himself a gardener, so he wrote accounts and pages and pages and pages descriptions of flowers. Akbar was an empire builder. He made sure that the best Persian artists were present in the Mughal courts. But my favorite was the Emperor Jahangir, who just had a deep, abiding love for the beautiful flowers that he saw in the, on the Indian subcontinent. He actually named Mansoor, the artist. He called him Nadir al-Asar, the wonder of the age. Such was his reverence for the master artist. Mansoor made over a hundred botanical artworks in Kashmir alone, Jahangir's favorite landscape and one that he visited with his favorite wife, Noor Jahan, 16 times. Mansoor was known for his use of a very specific stylistic device. He would introduce hovering objects in his flower portraits, such as butterflies and insects, to emphasize the rhythm and movement of the realistic, naturalist environments. Van Vaibhav. Flowers and branches also crept into the borders of portraits of human figures in the murakkas, or the individual paintings that were then mounted in albums. With attention showered on pollen dust, on pistils, the droop of a single leaf, the artists and ateliers were able to capture not just the physical beauty or the material reality of the flower, but also its feeling, its spirit, and its delicate essence. 
I'm going to, I had many Mansoor works, but I'm going to quickly, this is a beautiful Neil guy. Again, a botanical study done by Mansoor for Jangir. There was a lot of interplay between Europe and India. So what you see on the left is actually an extract from a book uh, created for Henry IV, King of France. And you see on the right that Mansoor has tried to copy these. So what he does is he copies the co composition and the way it's laid out in the plate, but he can't resist from adding color and form and life um, to his botanical study. <coughs> That's a zebra. Uh, many people who know me know the story of the zebra and how it arrived in Jahangir's court and he thought he was being made a fool of, that it was a donkey. So he got really upset and he had someone wash the zebra to see if the stripes would come off. Of course they didn't. And so the first thing he did was con commission Mansoor to make a portrait of the zebra and, and here is that. And it's of course sadly in the VNA. Let's now talk about Company Kalam, uh, which is controversial as well. Um, which is the name given to the overarching paintings that were created and commissioned by East India company officials in India. But was there really a difference between the Mughal style and the company school style? Many experts now feel that there really is no difference. So in the 18th century, as the British East India Company expanded its hold on the subcontinent, the botanical illustration became its most significant documentation style. And with the growth and might of the company, a number of its employees moved here to, of course, seek their fortune in the colonies. And this was a new class of travelers. They were exploring and recording what they witnessed with the mandate and desire to capture monuments and native people who they now saw as belonging to them, and also to scientifically document and itemize the flora and fauna of the subcontinent. But who would make these paintings? They hired Indian artists to paint these scenes and details for their travels. And the vast body of botanicals produced demonstrates the European enthusiasm for both botany and zoology. And the works that pro were produced by these artists merged the painting traditions of the East with the naturalism of the West and this is collectively known as Company Kalam today. This is again by, from William Roxburgh. So this bit, British patronage actually altered the course of Indian art making. Naturalistic work of this scale had almost never ever been required previously by Indian artists. So when work documenting botanical flora and fauna and animals started to be commissioned around the 1770s, it was done, it was commissioned to artists who actually had only previously worked on miniatures in royal courts and who were employed there. So practices that continued from the traditional miniature painting traditions had to now be adapted to a European palette. Artists moved from working in gouache to working to, with watercolors, and they were asked to subscribe to that Western way of following a systematic process that was laid out for painting in this style. Mughal artists never copied each other's style, so in fact they developed their own signature in the way they layered the canvas. But when they started painting for, for their British overlords now, they were told to, to follow a very precise style. So for example, the bodies of the, uh, of the stems, the tendrils, and the leaves were drawn first, and then the lines for leaf veins and flower profiles. So they also started to codify how these paintings should be made. These botanic illustrations, for all their scientific veracity, were still very much works of art, and they relied on many interpretations of local native accounts, which were often anecdotal and rooted in folklore, which largely went unrecognized. And these were often presented as discoveries. And while they ex looked Western in their visual compositions, they were actually layered with native knowledge and the immense skill of local artists, right? This actually is 
an Indian roller on sandalwood branch. It's from the Impi album created in Calcutta in 1780. And to just give you a sense of the value of these works, in 2018, Bonhams sold a single folio from the Impi album for the equivalent of 1.4 crores. And it measured 20 by 27 inches. It was attributed to the artist Bhavani Das. So the practice at the time was that artists themselves left no written records. So any information about them had to be gleaned from fleeting references in the documents of patrons and assumptions based on painting styles and techniques. Who were these countless unknown artists? The truth is, in many, many cases, we will never know. The records don't exist. In the northern and eastern part of the country, where the company Kalam mostly flourished, places like Murshidabad and Patna, we find pa painters who originated in Murshidabad, but who'd migrated to Patna in Bihar or to New Delhi, and they were often employed by people like Lady Mary Impey, who was the wife of the uh, Chief Justice of Bengal in 1773. She actually kept very, very detailed records, which is why we have the name of this artist, Zainuddin, one of the greatest artists of the time. So this artwork, which was part of the MP album, was commissioned by her to capture the flora, fauna, and animals in the menagerie that she kept in her garden. And she also kept extensive personal notes of habitat and behaviors, and that's all that we have to go on to try to place these artists. Sheikh Zainaldeen was prob probably one of the finest artists of this time. And luckily for us, he signed his name in Persian at the bottom left corner of this spectacular work of the Indian roller on a sandalwood branch. We also have an orange-headed, beautiful thrush on a purple ebony orchid branch. He was believed to have trained in Mughal te techniques, but as you can see, the absence of landscape and ground color in his work indicates that he was very familiar with European natural history paintings. I just want to show you something that's interesting. There's a collection called the Cresswell Collection, commissioned by Lady Cresswell after the MPs had left India. So probably Zainuddin, Bhavani Das, Ram Das went on to work for the Cresswells after having worked for the MPs. And what you can see on the right is a lovely English translation of the name that he signed in Bengali. And if you can see, it says Sak join a day. And one can only extrapolate that in Bengal, Sheikh Joinodin in a Bengali accent would translate into Sak join a day. And, how, and that's how he was sort of known in um, England. In the western and southern parts of the, company, uh, of the country though, the artists who painted were obviously different in tradition from the ones in the north and the east. So they didn't come from miniature traditions, but they came from traditional craft backgrounds. And William Roxburgh, the artist that he hired, for example, along the Coromandel Coast, they were actually chintz or kalamkari painters. And in the, 1940, uh, in the 1840s, a Scotsman, Hugh Clegg Cleghorn, actually used sandalwood car carvers from around the Shimoga area to make paintings for him. So this overarching arching, uh, term, company Kalam, actually has no meaning because in the north and the east, it was a Mughal painting tradition. In the south, it was often a craft tradition and these people all started making bot botanical paintings. So to sort of put it all under one umbrella really does not allow us to know anything about the painters, their styles, the differences in their approach, and the knowledge of the natural world that they brought to their works of art, you know. The, the Calcutta ones tend to be more, the northern ones tend to be more highly finished, and they use very traditional paint techniques of layering the paint and then burnishing it at the end. The ones in the south, Roxburgh's southern artists, they use a much more simplistic form, and what they do is they make a strong outline 
and then it's colored in. The Shimoga artists, the sandalwood carvers, tend to have a very calligraphic style where they use lines and, and light and shadow, very simple for a carving of a block. So if they were to carve a block, then that's the tradition that they brought over into the botanical paintings. I just want to tell you that last uh, month, Paul and I suddenly realized that there was an auction in London at Sotheby's, and it was uh, the library of Baron Fairhaven, books that had been collected over 100, 150 years, an incredible library that was being offered in auction. We were tremendously excited, and we changed all our plans, and we were very naive, and we thought how wonderful it would be to acquire some of these seminal works for us in India and put them out into the public domain. We lost many books to other bidders, but one of the books, and I'm so pleased and, and proud to say that's part of the Sarmaya collection now, is a book, uh, this book, this is actually from the Sadabi's catalog, it's in three volumes. It's called, uh, it's a description of East Indian plants by Nathaniel Wallach, and the best part is that these are all signed with artist names. And we've got a couple of folios from that on, in the display for you to see. The artists Vishnu Prasad and Gora Chad both signed these works, and we are absolutely thrilled that it's part of the Sarmaya collection. What is not part of the Sarmaya collection, and which Paul had, was ready to sell everything, including his four children and me, was the Hortus Malabaricus that came up in auction, the 11th volume Hortus Malabaricus, first edition. Uh, I won't tell you who bought it, but I will say it was bought by an Indian, so that was some consolation um, for us. But when it hit 200,000 pounds, I think we quickly put the catalog away and, and sat quietly in auction, but we were delighted to get um, this one. A unique project that's very close to my heart is Illustration of Oriental Memoirs by James Forbes, which is also here for you to see. He came here as a young 16-year-old, and he actually uh, made drawings and paintings himself. And the reason that they're unique and are, are a particular favorite, because unlike the botanical illustrations for study, he drew holistic images that were teeming, teeming with life. And he contextualized the paintings by leaving in local cultural symbols. So for example, this has a bulbul on a twig, which uh, has, well, oh no, sorry, the bulbul on the twig I think is not here. I'm so sorry. Um, so I, I think there's a very famous bulbul on a twig, which is, uh, we often show it, it's part of Sarmaya, it's, it's on our website, I encourage you to look at it. And he names the bulbul and he says, it's a bird of a thousand songs. And what I love is that that is such an Eastern description of this beautiful bird. His illustration of the mango tree, for example, he says, mango is one of the greatest blessings in India, and the tree is adorned with the most beautiful Indian butterflies. And he labels it, my friend, the Mazgaon mango of Bombay. So let me end by saying, what therefore is the role of the contemporary botanical? In a world that's increasingly glob globalized, commodified, and consumptive, there's a need to re-examine our relationship with nature. Botanical art can blur the boundaries, not just of art and science, but also of mere representation and passionate advocacy. It can create a space for dialogue and important conversations of representation, of caste, marginalized communities, and forgotten artists of a renewed relationship with nature, a holistic approach rather than one that merely seeks to itemize. Today, several Indian contemporary botanical artists are using the platform to go beyond aesthetics and scientific precision to include cultural and historical references in their work. And I'm going to share just three of my favorites. There are many. Oh, here's the custard apple. I'm so glad we have it. I was on the wrong slide, my apologies. That's James Forbes' custard apples, and there is, is his friend, the Mazgaon mango of Bombay. These are Arundhati 
Vartak's uh, beautiful paintings. I was introduced to her work almost 15 years old by Mamta Mangaldas. My friend Hema is here and she knows her well. And she introduced me to Arundhati Vartak's world, work. And what is amazing is that Arundhati Vartak's knowledge of classical Sanskrit poetry, folklore, myths, and legends related to trees come through in her works. Arundhati employs a miniature tradition, but within her work, she makes it a point to include the faces and people who were not earlier represented in classical miniatures. Her painting includes a young girl from a tribal community standing between a flowering mango tree at the start of spring. Adivasi communities, such as those the girl belongs to, are people who traditionally live much closer to nature, and Arundhati brings this point home to us. The depiction of the Parijat tree, it's called Harshingar in the north, uh, or the night flowering jasmine, is rooted in the mythical belief that Lord Krishna, a dark-skinned god, imported it from the heavens through a grayish blue sky. And there you see her painting of the Parijat. And the young girl depicted in both these works is filled with the promise of youth, evocative of a new spring, also reflected in the presence of birds and insects. Within her work is a coming together of cultural collective memory, allegory, and breaking down of in internal divisions of caste that have persisted in our own communities. Another one of my favorites is the artist Nirupa Rao, and she often does the book co covers, as you can see, for Amitav Ghosh. She's neither a trained illustrator or a botanist, but her love for nature and her observations on the growing alienation of communities from their natural surroundings inspired her to become a botanical illustrator. She has steadily grown as an artist who sees herself as a naturalist who is driven by the need for conservation. She's documented over 30 native species of rainforest trees of the Western Ghats in Southern India. And she's captured the leaves, fruit, flowers, and seeds, and the tree in its entirety. No easy task in a forest that's extremely tall and dense. Working in collaboration with other naturalists, she continues to unravel and showcase plant species in a way that's seen never before. And finally, I would like to leave you by sharing with you a fantastic work from the a beautiful work from the Sarmaya collection of an artist who is an exciting new voice in the landscape of both miniature and botanical art and whose work transcends these conventional no notions of East and West. Trained in the UK and in India, Jethro Buck's work tells a story of nature that straddles histories. His images detail magical landscapes fauna and flora that evoke joy and wonder, emotions to encourage treasuring of the planet. He says, and I quote, I'm more interested in stewardship and ancient Eastern traditions and concepts that speak of reverence for nature and all living creatures. In keeping with the theme of conservation, Jethro nods to people he admires. For example, if you, if you look in the right hand corner of the work, he, you see Jadav Padpayang, a environmentalist known for planting and tending to a forest reserve in Assam. This is the first time ever that we are showing uh, Jethro's work, Wild Things, and it's here. It's a difficult work to transport. It's a sensitive work, and uh, I encourage you to see it because I'm not sure how, whether we'll ever you know, show it. Uh, we, in li all likelihood won't show it very often, it's a very delicate work, but we wanted to bring it here to make the point. What Jethro does is he paints answers to the what if questions. What if the Mughals had arrived in England and its ateliers studied the horse chestnut tree, for example? What if Mansoor painted English botanicals? In the curatorial note for Wild Things, which showcases Jethro's work, the renowned art historian B.N. Goswami says that Jethro courts impossible encounters. He doesn't lay out an inventory of things, people and animals that he encounters. What he does instead is uses his art as an exploration. What all is out there is the question, 
and how, if at all possible, does one come to terms with this beautiful world? Chetro is amazed to discover the eightfold geometry of the horse chestnut tree and that each end of the leaf meets at a perfect intersection. So his deep fascination and detailed plant drawings blends with, with the artistic leaps of faith that he takes to depict a kind of modern botanical that shows nature as all pervasive and our essential magical relationship with the natural world. Van Vaibhav says, one tree on its own is lifeless. It comes alive only when it's connected. The splendor of the forest is only evoked when nature comes together as a whole. This is 3,000 year old insight now backed by 21st century science. In his amazing 2014 book, The Hidden Life of Trees, the German forester and researcher Peter Wallabin says that a tree can be only as strong as the forest that surrounds it. Botanical art has always bloomed sometime in the hours that separate pure intuition from cold fact. Drawing upon the craft of the artist and the rigor of the scientist, it actually exists above both and it soars above time to be something eternal and of eternal beauty and interest to us. Maybe that's why Mansoor's lilies still cast their fragrance even today. The purpose of the contemporary botanical is to capture the ephemeral beauty of an endangered planet and equally to capture our imagination. It's the call of the wild, but it's also a call to action. If flowers represent the fra fragile beauty of nature, then botanical art represents all the precious connections that still endure the ones that are really worth saving. It's a shimmering thread and it links history, art, myth, science and lived experience to define our place as humans in this web of life. Thank you all and thank you for indulging my running over time by several minutes. I don't think we have time for questions. Uh, we can do a quick Round of questions. So we have sorry. mics that we'll pass around if anybody has any questions. Oh, I love a no question audience. So either I've stunned everyone into silence or. Uh... Do you think the distance from home that makes people want to classify without uh, context? Well, I think it's the. More than the distance from home, I think it's, it's the desire for ownership. I think. Alexandra used to collect bits and boxes and set it back. Yeah. Because so you want to know what this is. It's curious. I don't know what it is. I would like to know what it is. Maybe I'll send it home. Someone will tell me what it is. I'm not sure. I, I, I know how. I've been told about how to complete it. But, you know, like the base of it is just to be curiosity and I don't know. Just so I think. I try not to judge. I love you. Um, I, I understand what you're saying, but it's not like there were no explorers in the East. So there were Eastern ex explorations as much as there were Western explorations. However, in the Eastern context, it always related in some sort of collaborative effort. I mean, you have art going back thousands of years, the Silk Road, for example. So rather than taking, inventorizing, itemizing, and owning, it was about a confluence of ideas, an exchange of traditions. So the Silk Road existed for centuries, yet no, people came, they met, they exchanged ideas, but you see, the, you see that influence in the language of art and craft in their own communities. There was never a question of going and owning something and say, okay, now this belongs to me. So I will detail it, I will commodify it, I will inventorize it, I will see how I can take it back and make it, turn it into dollars for my, my own self and my country. I think it's a difference in how we see the world, oral cultures versus written cultures. The idea of a whole, a cosmos, a collaborative, a community driven thing versus uh, an individual, you know, sort of creating for one's own acquisition you know, it's, it's, it's in philosophy as well. I, I mean, I would also say you see that in Western and Eastern philosophy. Plato, Hobbes, Locke, 
We talked about man in the state of nature and the need to control, the need to own. But if you look at Eastern philosophy, the Vedas, Vedanta, the Buddhist texts, the Upanishads, you never see this conflictual ownership-led relationship with nature. So I do think uh, this is one of those instances where judgment is necessary because it does point out a very different, two very different ways of seeing the world. I mean, obviously, I, I think that the Western worldview also created the Industrial Revolution. And I mean, we're so grateful for that. So you can't really, I think you can't really go back in history and, I, and judge. But I think the reverse is also true. You can't sort of pretend that that view did not exist. So I think this is less of a judgment and more an acknowledgement that these very different ways of seeing led to the exclusion of many of the artists, many of the communities, many of the people who were engaged in this meaning making. <laughs> Thank you so much. Subscribe to Sarmaya and be a part of the stories and conversations around art, history and culture.